بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today inshallah we continue with the major signs we uh, left off very quickly last week on the, uh, the other signs but I wanted to just let you know what the rest of the major signs were Today, inshallah, we'll go into a bit more detail about them. What we've already discussed are two, well, one in detail, which is Imam al-Mahdi, who will come out at, before the last hour. And we discussed many things about al-Mahdi, and that there are many people out there who have got different narrations and opinions about who al-Mahdi is. But Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us great hints about who this Mahdi is and evidence as clear as the sun about when he comes out and what are his signs. So anyone who claims that Imam al-Mahdi has come out already has lied. And whoever claims that he's going to come out anywhere other than in Mecca has lied. For the ahadith are in Bukhari and Muslim, a lot of them, and many other sahihs speaking about Imam al-Mahdi, who he is, describing his features, describing his characteristics, describing the events that will occur when he comes out as a sign of the true Mahdi. So let's not, inshallah, confuse ourselves and refer back to last week's talk to know a little bit about al-Mahdi. And... The only thing I didn't mention about Al-Mahdi last week was that he is also from the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So he is from his family lineage. You are able to follow his tree, family tree, it's there, all the way to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is from Sulalat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Muslim as well, that he is min ahli bayti. He is from my family line. And he will appear in Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him enormous power, great power. I'm talking about power of authority and leadership. Great army. He will have extraordinary wealth. Gather it all. And he will manage it. And change the world from the state of oppression to the state of justice. Just as it was filled with oppression. He will destroy things like capitalism, for example. He will have more control of the money and he will distribute it in a just way. To the point where the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi tells us that, that the, there, there will be no one. There will come a time in his time where there will be no one to receive the zakat or charity. Because there are no poor people anymore. And they'll say, give it to so and so. I have enough. They're probably poorer than I am. But there's no poor people. Zakat can't be given and sadaqah can't be given to anyone. In wealth wise we're talking about. And this is Imam al-Mahdi, he will live with an army that will fight a people from the Arabian Peninsula. A group of them, the earth will swallow them, and a group of them, he will destroy them. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, what if in that group of army which he destroys are people who do not intend to fight the Mahdi, but they've got mixed knowledge, they're confused. And they're thinking that they're on the right path. He said, everyone that dies on that day will be raised according to their intention that they were fighting for. According to his intention. Then he will fight another army who will come to fight him from Bilad Al-Furs, which is Persia in those days. Today, today, now, it's where Iran is. It's Iran in particular. Whether it will remain as Iran or not, Allahu A'lam. At the moment in Iran... The leading population are the Rafida. Rafida, they're known as Shia at the moment. Whether they are the ones or whether it's someone else, Allah only knows. But just to point this out, the Rafida, the Shia, have a different idea 
about who Al-Mahdi is. Totally different to the Mahdi of ours. I'm not going to go into detail about that. You can ask them if you know one. But he is a very different Mahdi to ours. And there happened a particular fight one time in Mecca a few years back which involved the Rafidah and someone was thought to be the Mahdi but this man was killed. And the Mahdi cannot be killed like that until he rules the world. And for 10 years he fills it with justice. And his name is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. Just like the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, son of Abdullah, his father. And he will have the same characteristics as the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Same character, very similar manners and character. We described his features last week. His army will fight the Romans. The Romans in those days, or the Byzantines in those days, today are most likely the majority of the Europeans. They're the descendants of the Romans and the Byzantines. So whoever they are today, and they are mostly the European descendants of the uh, Romans, Byzantines, Al-Mahdi will have his army to fight them. And Rasul Sallallahu said, تُصَالِحُونَ الرُّومِ You will unite together with, or you will have a treaty, a partnership with the Romans. In those days, as I said, Romans today, most likely the Europeans. You will have a treaty with them together, a partnership deal, where you will fight an enemy that is the Romans' enemy. Aduwa min wara'ihim. You will fight an enemy that's for the Romans. You will win. And then a fight will erupt between the Muslims and the Christians. Ar-Rum in those days were known as the cross bearers or the crusades. And they will return. They will return. And the Muslims will fight. There will be a war between the Kitabiyun, the people of the book, and the Muslims. We spoke about this last week, but just to recap, Yani. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi told us it will be maqtalatun it would be, it would be malhamatu, al-malhamatul kubra, he called it. The great war, the great combat. You will find that the flying object on the sides, outside, on the outskirts of the war, will drop from the sky from the intensity of this battle. They will fall from the sky from the intensity of this battle. Allahu A'lam. Allahu A'lam what this is interpreted as, but what we can guess, just a guess, is nuclear weapons. But Allah knows best. Because what will make the flying objects or flying birds drop from the sky unless you just shoot them down? But the hadith is not saying it will be a fight with the birds. Nor will people be shooting birds down. They will drop from the intensity of the war. Wallahu a'lam, what else that could mean? He said, the Muslims will send out a shurta. A shurta is like a large group of army, a batch, a brigade. And they will fight until the night departs between them. Is it the first night? Is it the second night? Is it nights after? Allahu a'lam. Some scholars said it's the first night, some said later on. Many other nights later, Allahu a'lam, which one it is. But the point is, the night will depart between them for some reason. And everyone will, will rest at their, wherever they are. He says, فَتَفْنَ shurta. The whole brigade, the Muslim brigade that was sent out will perish. Not only perish, the word tafna means they will become extinct or they will disappear. Tafna, disappear. Like those aeroplanes and ships you heard about that go into the Bermuda Triangle, they, they disappeared and no one knows where they went. That's what will happen to this brigade. But they are proper Muslims, fighting in a proper war for the sake of Allah. They'll send out a next brigade, same thing will happen to them. And they'll send out a third brigade, same thing will happen to them. We don't know the details of timing and place. But what we do know is that if it's three brigades and they will disappear and it will be, they said, Ya Rasulullah, where will it be? He said, it, is, it will be in Asham. In Asham. And also, Sham today, you know where Asham is? We're talking about what we used to be called Greater Syria. To some people, Asham means Syria itself, where it is ruled by the President um, Al-Assad. But no, it is not that. It is the greater Syria which is known before World War I, greater Syria, which involves you know, countries like Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, right, even Iraq and those areas. 
probably ends with, with Iraq, the Sham. And he said, These, this fight will be in the Sham. And he said, the best of all people will be in the Sham. And the ones who will rise against them will be in the Sham. He even said, Anta fi ribatim ma dumta fi sham. You are in a, in a, in a, um, you are standing guard as if you are in a war. Standing guard until the last hour, so long as you are in the sham. Meaning the sham will never cease from battles. Or from always standing guard. Will always be at risk in a sham. I went and lived in Lebanon for four years only, and this was the most peaceful time in the 19, early 90s. And in that time, two potential wars happened, potential. Two things happened over there that were potentially going to return back the civil war. And it was always at an unrest. People are expecting anything to happen any day. From ever since we know Hashem, it's been like that. Wars have passed through there and battles. It's not because it's, it's a bad country, a'udhu billah. It is actually a blessed place. But look, the good and evil always fight. And the good and evil will keep on combating to the last hour. This, this land, the sham, has the good in it. Now it's mixed. But the good will always be in the sham and the evil will always be fighting it. Wherever the good is, the, the evil is fighting it. Wherever the evil is, the good is fighting it. Abedan. And Rasul Sallallahu told us, as sira bayn al-haqq wal batil The combat between truth and false will always be there till the last hour. And the false will always be a little bit ahead. Why? Because the truth will beat the false, then another false will come. It's easy to make up false things. But the truth remains the truth. It never changes, never adds, never diminishes. So in a sham, you're always in battle. And Rasulullah told us in those days, the best of all believers will be in that place. The best of all of them will be in that place. Rasul Sallallahu asked Allah to barak in Asham, to bless Asham and its people. And over there, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, will be these battles. There will also be a group of people who are also in Asham, and Rasul Sallallahu spoke about them in particular. And we don't know their names or their, their, their exact nationality, but we know where they're situated. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the Sahih Hadith, there will come a time, he's telling this to his companions, where there will be a group of believers who will be on the truth. They will have learned the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very well. They would have digested it and taught their children well. So they live the life of Islam, even though the odds are all against them from everywhere. But they live it, even if it's only a small amount of them. He said, the people will gather against them, and they will keep on fighting and protecting the symbols of Islam and the truth and justice. He said, Wallahi, one of their martyrs, one of their martyrs, is better than 50 of yours, of the companions. They said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, who are these people, yani, and why? Why is this the case? He said, لِأَنَّكُمْ تَجِدُونَ أَعْوَانَ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ You, alhamdulillah, you fight, and you, your war is amazing, and your, your, your martyrdom is amazing, and you fight for justice, and... Uh, protect the innocent and all your blood and everything. However, you have helpers. You've got helpers now. You've got supporters, Muslims supporting one another. But them, when their time comes, they will look everywhere and they will find no helpers. Their brothers will desert them, their Muslim brothers will desert them, the countries will desert them, the leaders will not help them, and they are only on their own. They said, Ya Rasulullah, where are they found? He said, in those days they will be... be on the outskirts or the borders of Jerusalem. They're there. Are they there now? Probably. Will they be there more later on? Allahu alam. Maybe. But to the best of my guess is that they are there now. Now fighting. 
protecting. And they are not really known or heard about in the media because we know what the media is all about. Changing false into truth and truth into false. As they suit. Whoever's in power. So this is what's going on in there. Rasul Sallam told us about. He even told us the truth is the false and the false becomes the truth and the leaders are the ones who betray and the leaders are the ones who don't, are not qualified and the people who are placed in leadership and responsibility are the ones not qualified for the responsibility. The people who are qualified and the true leaders are put backwards, meaning they're put underneath these betrayers and these unqualified people. As he said, إذا وسدت الأمانة إلى غير أهلها فارتقب الساعة. الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم said, when the trust or the responsibility is given to people who are not qualified for it, then wait for the last hour to come. Meaning, await for it. It's very soon, very soon. المهدي's army will fight, and these people will gang will come with them, and they will, in the end, they will be victorious against this Roman army. And Rasul Sallallahu said, as Ibn Abbas narrates this hadith, radiallahu anhu, in a long hadith where a man saw smoke in the sky and he ran to Ibn Abbas and said to him, the last hour has come, the last hour has come. He was reclining, then he sat up and he said, no, no, the last hour could not have come yet. And he said, the last hour will not come until the Muslims fight the Romans be Dabiq. Dabiq is a place close to the, sh- in the Sham, a little bit outside of Medina, in Dabiq. So you, you can see, Rasul Sallam telling us in that area, outside of Medina, not directly in Saudi, but, or in Medina because it's in Saudi, but outside of it, somewhere in, a, in Dabiq, in the mid part of Asham, of the Middle East that we know of today. He said, you will fight the Romans in Dabiq, and um, he said, you will fight them tremendously until the flying object will fall from the sky, and all of this will happen to you. Then finally, the rest of the Muslims that are left, men, women, and children, they'll come up and they'll fight them and they'll be victorious. He said, حين لا يفرح بغنيمة ولا بميراث. Ibn Abbas said, the day when there will be no rejoice or excitement over any inheritance that was left behind or over any booty of war. Because if there was a hundred people in a family, 99 of them would have perished and died in this war. So it's a fierce war, terrible war. It's about to come. And a large reason for it being terrible is the disunity of the Muslims. The sectarianism that we are now in. The groupism that we are now in. The disunity of the Muslims following particular men. Not following Rasulullah but following particular men. In a time where the truth, the truth is evaluated by the man they follow. Meaning, whatever the man is, that's the truth. It should be the opposite. It should be that the truth is there and you judge the man by the truth. You don't judge the truth by the man. And today it's like that. You judge the truth by the man. If you like the man, you say that's the truth and you don't listen to anyone else. The truth is there. Rasul showed us to it as clear as the sun. So this biased approach that we have and prejudice has spread throughout the world. And this is why we have reached what we have reached. Rasul Sallallahu said, 80 nations will gather against you. Thamanuna raya, raya, 80 flags, 80 nations will gather against the Muslims in Asham. We will win. The final victory is for the Muslims. However, we'll be in that state. And these Muslims will go also to a place that the Prophet ﷺ called it Qustantiniya. Constantinople. The Turkish people would know where that place is. And they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, where is this place? He said, have you heard of that land which is part in land and part of it's in water? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. Istanbul, Constantinople, those areas. He said, the Muslims will regain it. And it was twice the Muslims will take it. They took it over once, it will be taken from them, or it will be transformed and divided, and then it will be taken once again under the Sharia of Islam. He said that time when the Romans are defeated, the Muslims will be in power. And they will go to Constantinople. 
And now we'll take it over with three takbirs. They'll come to the first part, reciting the words Allahu Akbar. As soon as the people of that part hear them, they will give in the land. They'll give it in. They won't even fight. They'll keep going into the land. They'll reach half of it, saying the words Allahu Akbar, and the people will just give it to them. They'll say, we can't beat these people. Until finally they take the rest of it. It will get worse before it gets better. And whether it be Muslims who convert into becoming non-Muslims, apostate, or whether they, um, Christians take over or whoever other non-Muslims take over, that's, this place will get worse before it gets better. And the Prophet ﷺ said every generation that comes is worse than the generation, their state is worse than the generation before. Finally, it will be called out. And it will be said, please run back to your family and homes for a Dajjal has come out. Now, this is the second major sign I want to discuss. Ad-Dajjal, literally in Arabic, the word Ad-Dajjal means the liar, the betrayer, uh, the illusionist, all, right, all these words, the trickster, or more than that, but illusionist, the deceiver, Ad-Dajjal, Dajjal, in every way that you can think of lies, all of its forms, Ad-Dajjal will have all these forms. And the worst the most dangerous thing that Dajjal will have is the psychological deception. Dajjal, the worst, I mean, what's so bad? I mean, we've had many wars before and Muslims have been wiped out in countries, in places before. But this Dajjal, he doesn't wipe out or take over the rule or authority or power in the world really by weapons of mass destruction or, you know, all that stuff. He takes it over by the psychological war. And what do we live in today? What kind of wars do you think today are the strongest and most dangerous wars? It's not the wars of blood, the mass destruction. No. It is the ideological wars that we are living now. You could be living in the most peaceful country and through the internet and television, our youth, our Muslim youth, are being destroyed mentally, psychologically. Where there is, uh, how can I explain it? We are now in a time of what we can call uh, something like a, a very complex reverse psychological war, reverse psychology, mixed with uh, other deceptions. You look at the evil and you think it's good, and it comes to you with a smile, and our youth think it's okay, until religion is looked at as a restriction rather than a protection. We're not going to dwell too much on that, but what I do want to let you know is that at the moment, the Dajjal will not come until there are prerequisites. There are certain occurrences that are going to happen before the Dajjal comes out. And this man, a Dajjal, will come out at a time where the world is ready to accept him in his Dajjal, in his deception. He'll find followers. A Dajjal. Rasul Sallallahu called him Al Masih al Dajjal. Or Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Why? The word Al-Masih, the one wiped, wiped off. Or because referring to one of his eyes, it looks like it's wiped. It's, the light has gone away from it. It's dark and he can't see with it. One eye he can't see. And it will look like it's flat, like a grape that has its liquid sucked out of it. Al-Masih. And sometimes Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. The Christ, the liar. The Christ, the liar. In the Bible, he's called the Antichrist, or in Judaism, Antichrist. So he is an Antichrist against Isa alayhi salam. Rasul Sallallahu called him Masih al-Dajjal. The Christ who is the liar, meaning he's not, he's not the real Christ. But he will make people think that he is. This man, al-Masih al-Dajjal, Rasul Sallallahu told us, will cause fitna to all people with everything that Allah has given him of powers. He will make rain come down as he wills wherever he wants it to come. And he'll deny it from the people he doesn't want to have rain. He can revive the land with crops and plantation and he can cause another land to be dead and never have crops and plantation. So no food for its people. And many other such 
uh, you know, powers which Allah has given him in order to test the people as one of the final tests for mankind towards the end of the last time. As for Isa alayhi salam, in order to distinguish him from him, Isa alayhi salam used to heal the blind bi idnillah, and he could raise the dead bi idnillah. Really, like in real. A Dajjal can't do these. But he will be an illusion. He will make it look like he has risen people from the dead. And I'm going to explain that in a minute, inshaAllah. He is also called al Masih, not only because of the, the eye that looks like it's been wiped off, but also the word Masih in Arabic means that the one who will spread out through the world. He will go everywhere in the world. And it's also true. He will go everywhere in the world. He will reach every place in the world and occupy it except for two places. Mecca and Medina. Or Tiba. Or Yathrib, as it's called. It's got three names. It's got several names. Al-Masih calls it, Al-Masih al-Dajjal calls it Tiba. Tiba means Medina and Mecca. He will not be able to set foot. He will not be able to go into it. But he will reach its borders. And he'll try to deceive the people who are in there. So, Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal, who first come out to say, I am Christ, I am Isa, alayhi salam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi describes him, Aj'ad al-Shar. He's got very coarse hair. He is a man from the children of Adam. When he comes out, the believers will know him and they will not be deceived by him. He will have three letters on his forehead, kafara, which means kufr or kafar, the hider of the truth or the rejecter of the truth. He will be young in age. He's not old, probably in his mid-thirties. He's red-skinned, meaning he's more reddish in color when you look at him. He's not tall, he's short. Reasonably short, relatively short. But his body is very stocky, it's huge. Like when you look at him you say, well, this is, he is a huge man, but he's very stocky, he's not too tall, he's quite short actually. His skin is coarse as well, and his face looks rough. And his forehead is wide. His forehead is wide. His chest is wide. Wide shoulders. His right eye looks like it's been wiped off. Like that grape. The right eye he can't see with. He can only see with his left. And this eye doesn't look like it's poking out, nor does it look like it's hollow. It just looks, as I said, like a dry piece of grape. His left eye has got an extra piece of meat on it. So it looks like it's got a piece of extra meat either underneath or on top of it. So Rasul Sallallahu is describing him in detail here. And the letters on his forehead are not, are either, Rasul Sallallahu told us, they're either cut, meaning letter by letter, or they're joined. But they mean the same thing. Every Muslim will be able to read it except the kafir. And one of his other descriptions is that he is impotent. He, can, he cannot have children. He cannot have children. Nor does he get married. These are some of his detailed descriptions which the Prophet ﷺ told us about. So Dajjal is not a metaphor. It's not, uh, I mean some people they say to you, the Dajjal, of, the, the, the Dajjal what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about is the television. The television is, is one-eyed and it lies to you. No. Rasul gave a particular description because the TV doesn't have coarse hair, right? And it doesn't have two eyes. Okay? And it doesn't have the three letters, kafara. You can play beautiful Quran on the TV if you want. Uh, there is a man at the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, I'll just tell you his story. His name was nicknamed Ibn Sayyad, Safi Ibn Sayyad. His name was Safi, son of Sayyad. Has anyone heard about him? Safi Ibn Sayyad? No? Okay, we'll tell you his story. This man, Safi Ibn Sayyad, 
He lived at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was a young boy who was raised originally from a Jewish family. And he hated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immensely. He was grown to hate him a lot. And they used to say that this young boy, Safi ibn Sayyad, he was able to tell you what you're thinking. He had these certain abilities. True story. And it's in the Sahih. It's not something made up. And Rasul Sallallahu heard about him. And he wanted to go one day to find out whether he was really the Dajjal or not. He goes, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was with him. And they were going towards the village where Safi ibn Sayyad was. And he was sitting down playing with something, when his mother, when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was trying to come, Umar al-Khattab describes, he says, he's coming from tree to tree. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is hiding behind the trees, trying to come closer to this boy, to try and hear what he's saying. He was saying some things, he wanted to hear him, what he says. As Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached Safi, very closely, he got very close and started to hear what he's saying. Suddenly, the boy's mother saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she said, Ya Safi, daka Muhammad. Muhammad's there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Safi looked up and stopped talking. He started getting angry. <sighs> like that. He hated him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for no reason. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If only his mother didn't see me, I could have listened for a few more words and I would have known whether he is the Dajjal or not. Because people were talking about him being the Dajjal himself. That he will rise from there and he will be the Dajjal. Rasul Sallallahu said to the boy, he said, أَخْبَأْتُ لَكَ شَيْئًا I hit something inside of my, my brain, inside of my, my chest, that I want you to try and figure out what it is. And the boy looked, frowned a bit, and he said, أَدُّخْ أَدُّخْ I can only get أَدُّخْ أَدُّخْ The Prophet Sallallahu said, لا على قدرك May your power never rise beyond that. And Rasul Sallallahu said to him, Do you believe that I am the messenger of God? He said, Only if you believe that I am the messenger of God. So he's a bit of a cocky dude. Isn't it? I'm the messenger of God. Prophet Sallallahu got up and left. Umar al-Khattab asked him, What was that adukh? What did you hide inside of you? What was that, that word that you kept hidden? He said, I hid the word ad-dukhan. Ad-dukhan, which means the smoke. And he guessed half of it. This man, Safi, this boy, Safi ibn Sayyad, grew up. And he lived in Medina. He actually embraced Islam. And he got married. And they say that he had something like ten children. And, one, and, and the companions used to avoid him. They, they couldn't trust being around him. One day, they're coming back for, they went to do Hajj. And they're coming back from Hajj. And on the way, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, or was it... Uh, no, no, not Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Another, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was sitting next to him, like t- next to a shade under a tree, resting. And then Safi ibn Sayyid got his luggage up and sat next to this companion. And the companion looked at him and he sort of didn't want him to be next to him. And he said to him, "Look, there's lots of shade around. You can go and sit somewhere else." So he started to cry. Safi ibn Sayyid cried. He said to him, "What are you? Why are you crying?" He said, about what everyone's saying about me, that I'm the Dajjal and all of that stuff. And he looked at him and said, you should know of all people, this companion was an Ansari from Medina, you are very knowledgeable. You should know that a Dajjal is not a Muslim, and I'm a Muslim. He cannot get married, and I'm married. He cannot have children, and I have children. And he cannot enter Mecca or Medina, and here I am. The companion said, well, he's right. You have a point. Then Safi ibn Sayyid said to him, But you know what? That name is quite nice. It's a cool name to call me a Dajjal with all those powers. I wouldn't mind if I was actually him. And the companion got up and said, Please stay away from me. And he walked away from him. And while Safi ibn Sayyid was laughing. So this man was a very strange person. After the Prophet's death, there was the, uh, that great fight, that great war that happened with Musaylam al-Kathab, 
where uh, hundreds of memorizers of the Quran were murdered. And they looked, Safi bin Sayyad was fighting with them, and they looked for his body, and they say, we could never find him neither among the dead or the living. And all of his children died. And his wife died. And after that battle, they couldn't find him at all. He vanished. This is the story of Ibn Sayyad, or Ibn Sa'id, is also called. So, Allahu Alam, whether he was, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu used to say, I used to say in front of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Wallahi, he is the Dajjal. And the Prophet wouldn't deny what I said, nor would he confirm. He'd just stay quiet. So the matter of, of, of the Dajjal is quite a very uh, peculiar and, and uh, confusing one until he actually arrives. Because here's the next story that will, will let a person ask a lot of questions about what a Dajjal really is and what are his powers. Was he Ibn Sayyad or was he someone, someone else or does he actually live at the moment is unknown. Or whether he's dead is unknown. However, there is a hadith by, narrated by this companion called Tamim al dari Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us, and this hadith by the way is uh, narrated by Imam Muslim on the conditions of Muslim, meaning it's a very strong chain of narration. And cutting the story short, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called the people of Medina one day and said, come quickly to the masjid. So they came and sat in the masjid and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up with his stick. Every time he went to address the people, he would stand up, a little bit of a high position on a rock or something, and he would hold a stick with him. And he said to them, Do you know why I have gathered you here? They said, Allah and His Messenger, no. It wasn't time of prayer, it wasn't time of anything. He said, Let everyone stay in the position that they would normally pray. Yani if you like as if you're coming for prayer, sit. And then the Prophet Wasallam said, I did not call you because of some kind of good news or bad news that you should fear or anything like uh, in particular right now. However, this man here who I have, Tamim al dari has just told me something that I have always told you about. But there is a, a little bit of an extra detail to it, and I want him to say this to you. So he asked Tamim al dari to say it. And Tamim al dari who had embraced Islam, he used to be a Christian, embraced Islam, an Arab. He got up and he said, uh, we were in a, a ship, and a huge storm hit us. And we were lost, until our ship reached an island. We entered the island. Now, in another hadith, Rasul Sallallahu is the one who is narrating this hadith on his behalf. He says, A beast came to us on this island. It had so much hair on it that we could not tell the front from its back. Which was its head, which was its tail. We don't know. And we said, وَيْلَكِ مَا أَنْتِ Woe to you, what are you? <laughs> Never seen a creature like you before. And she spoke. The beast said, أنا الجساسة I am, you can say الجساسة comes from the word spy or the passer of news. They said, وَمَا الجساسة What is this الجساسة, this spy or this passer of news? And then the beast said, أَيُّهَا الْقَوْمِ People, انطلقوا إلى هذا الرجل في الدير Come, come to this man who is waiting for you in a dair. A dair was known in those days as being like a place where people used to worship. Like where monks or people used to dedicate their life for worship, they used to sit in there and worship. No matter what religion they were. They're called ar-rahib, ruhban, monks. They used to sit in there. And he said, there is a man who is waiting for your news in great uh, ambition, in great uh, ang um, uh, anxiously. They said, when the beast told us about this man, a man, they said, we ran away from the beast immediately thinking it was a jinn or a shaitan or something. And ran to this man, to this human being. We entered this 
hut that was set for worship. And suddenly we saw in front of us a person, a man, who was the biggest in build that we have yet to have seen. And he was so coarse in his body and in his features, strong and coarse and big. His arms were wrapped to his neck with chains like this. And his head and arms were also chained together to his knees, to his legs, like this. So you can barely you can just look up, and he's chained up really well. He couldn't move. His legs and arms into his neck. We said, what are you? And he said, you are able to hurt me, because I'm chained up. So it's my right to ask, who are you first? <laughs> so I can ensure my safety. They said, very well. We are people from the Arabs. We rode, we set sail in our ship and a storm hit us until we became lost and landed on this island. We came to this island and we found this beast that came to us that had so much hair on it. We asked it, who are you? And it said to us, I am the spy or the passer of news. And it led us to you. They said, we got afraid of this man and we, did, we didn't feel safe around him. However, the man said to us, tell me about the palm trees of Baisan. Baisan is a city in Jordan. And he wanted to know whether there were palm trees planted in there a lot. We said, what do you exactly want to know about Baisan in Jordan? He said, I ask you, are there more palm trees and have they be filled with dates or not yet? They said, yes, it is full of palm trees and full of dates. More than many other places in, in, in what we know. He said, soon its palm trees and dates will become scarce. It will no longer give fruits. Today, really, in Jordan... Dates are scarce now. It used to be in history, abundance. Now listen. He said, now explain to me about Buhayra Tabariya. You know what Tabariya is? Which ocean, which sea that is? Okay, the Tabariya Sea. It's also close to Asham. They said, what do you want to know about it? He said, does it have water in it? He said, they said, yes, there's lots of water. He said, soon its water is going to go away. It's not going to exist anymore. And truly today, the water has gone drier than before. Then he asked them, he said, tell me about Zagar fountain. And Zagar fountain is uh, somewhere near Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis. Probably about three days journey if you wanted to walk away from Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis, that's where that fountain is. So basically in what we call Israel today. They said, what do you want to know about this fountain? He said, well, is there a large fountain happening and a great river from it? And do people plant a lot of vegetation around it and it gives a lot of water yet? They said, yes, it's got a lot of water and its people plant a lot. They said, okay, tell me about a prophet who is ummi, who is illiterate, cannot read or write. What has he done? They said he has come out in Mecca and now he lives in Yathrib, in Medina. He asked them, have his people fought him? They said, yes. He said, what did he do? They said, he was driven out by his own people. But he went to another Arab who are the, the, the Yathri people and those who embrace Islam with him, and they uh, obeyed him. This man said to them, really, has that really happened? They said, yes. He said, أَمَا إِنَّ ذَاكَ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ أَنْ يُطِيعُوهُ He said, behold, it is better for those people who obey him to keep on obeying him. 
is actually supporting the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now I'm going to tell you about myself. Inni ana al I am Christ. Isa alayhi salam. Wa inni ushaku an yu'dhana li fi al khuruj fa akhruj. He said, now very soon, based on the signs you've showed me, I'm going to be given permission to leave and I'm going to come out. Fa asiru fi al ard. I will walk throughout the land. فَلَا أَدَعْ قَرْيَةً إِلَّا هَبَطُّهَا فِي أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً He said, there, isn't, there wouldn't be a village or a city or a place on earth except that I would have reached it all in 40 days. The whole world in 40 days. غَيْرَ مَكَّةً وَطِيبَةً All except two places, Mecca and Tiba, Medina. فَهُمَا مُحَرَّمَتَانِ عَلَيَّ كِلْتَاهُمَا He said, they are both forbidden for me to enter. Now when we say he enters, it means he conquers, takes over. He owns it. He goes, every time I wanted to come into one of them, an angel will stand guard holding a, a sword. And he will prevent me from entering Mecca and Medina. He said, and now between the, every two mountains that you can find a pathway entering into, into Mecca and Medina. There are groups of angels standing guarding it right now to the last hour. There are always angels from any, if you're going to enter Mecca or Medina through any pathway through, through mountains, two mountains, there will always be angels within there guarding it, but we cannot see them. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. started grabbing his, his, uh, his stick and sort of he put it close to his, to his hip وسلم, and then he began to bang to hit the ground with it like this but he was sort of tense وسلم, something very important he was really tense about it and he hit the floor and he said Ala hadhi tiba. behold everyone this is tiba meaning he's pointing this is Medina he's in Medina he's saying this is tiba the people there didn't know what tiba is a lot of them and he said, this is Tiba that he's telling you about. It's Medina, which you are in right now. He said, didn't I tell you that this man will come out and not be able to enter this land? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, because he had told them a lot about it before. He said, the hadith of Tamim and Dari, Wallahi amazed me as he told me about him. Because it's the same as what I used to tell you about Mecca and Medina. Behold, a Dajjal is somewhere in one of, near the oceans, in one of the, the, on an island in one of the oceans of a sham. That's where Dajjal is right now. He is in one of the oceans and the islands of the oceans of a sham, which some scholars say a Dajjal is now living. He said, O Bahr al Yemen, or maybe the oceans of Yemen. But then the Prophet ﷺ corrected himself, said, La, bal min qibal al mashriq ma hu. He said, No, no, no. Somewhere towards the east, the east of Medina, somewhere there, he said, in one of those oceans, on an island there somewhere. Min qibal al mashriq ma hu, towards the east, somewhere. Min qibal al mashriq ma hu. And he pointed to his hand that way, towards the east, because that way. So even the Prophet doesn't know exactly where he is, but in that direction. So he's close to the Middle East at the moment. So Allahu A'lam, ad dajjal will first arise in Asham, in the Middle East area. And which gives a lot of, you know, sense that, you know, Christians and Jews will be among the first to follow him. They'll actually, the Jews will be the first to follow him because they are waiting for their Messiah to come. They don't believe that Isa alayhi salam was it. And they don't want to accept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So they'll be the first to follow ad dajjal They feel, they say, he is the real Isa. As for the Christians, they believe in the coming of Isa alayhi salam. Because they've mixed up their scriptures, they will think that this is the man. And because he will say, I am Isa, they will ask for him, السلام, they will ask for miracles, and he will do these miracles. Some of them won't be convinced. See, afterwards he'll say that I am God. Ana ilahukum. And then they'll say, what proof do you have? He said, only God can raise the dead. He said, okay, what if I raise your parents from the dead? They said, yes, we'll believe your God. So he will be able to get the jinns, the shayateen, to work for him, and he will raise them to become, you know, to look like their parents. Well, not raise them, we'll let, tell them to look like their parents, and they will speak to them. And so the people, non-Muslim people and the weak Muslims will follow him. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept on speaking about Ad-Dajjal that day. The companions said, we feared 
Because he told us that was, his time was so near, so close, that we started to feel as if he's just behind the trees somewhere. And his time is coming very close. And he said, if he comes out in my time, I am responsible to protect you from him. But if I die and he comes out, it's every Muslim to himself. Ad-Dajjal will live for 40 days, as we said. In the first day, it will be as long as a year. The second day, as long as a month. The third day, as long as a week. And the rest of the day is normal. And there will be one man who will be able to... Who, who, who will do something. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I know him, and he is the best man in, on that day. He will come warning the people, saying he is not God, he is not God, he is a Dajjal, he is the Antichrist. And they will say, what are you saying about our Lord? So they'll bring him to him. And he will say, I am your God, look what I can do. He said, you are the liar, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about you. So he'll bring a saw, and he'll saw him in half. And then he'll walk between the two body parts, and the man will come and rise will become alive again. And the Prophet ﷺ told us he will be able to do that once, just once. And the man said, the Dajjal says to him, now do you believe I am God? And he says, now I believe more that you are not God, but you are actually a Dajjal, because you cannot do this to me again. And truly, he will not be able to do that again. He will throw him into his fire. And Rasul ﷺ tells us he will have something that looks like a fire and something that looks like water. He said it's an illusion. The fire is his water and his water is his fire. Go to the fire to drink from it if you see it. And the man vanishes, disappears. Rasul Sallallahu says, he is the best, he's a real man, you know, the best of men in that day who tries to call the people away from the worship of a Dajjal. After the 40 days have ended, the Muslims will be praying behind Al-Mahdi, almost about to pray Salat al-Zuhr. Also in the Hadith in Sahih Muslim you will find it. They'll be praying in Asham in Syria, in Syria in particular in Damascus, in Dimashq, in a mosque called Masjid al-Minar al-Bayda. Rasul Sallallahu named it. The one with the white minaret. They call it that name now in Damascus. It's got many white minarets and it, it really shines and lights up very well. There will be a small a group of army praying with al-Mahdi in that masjid. As they were about to play the dhuhr, suddenly Isa alayhi salam descends, the real Isa alayhi salam. And the two angels will be carrying him on each side, he'll be wearing two garments, and his beard will be long, it will be black, and his hair will be long and black. It will be not curly and not dead straight, and it will, it will reach his shoulders as if it is dropping with water, as if water is seeping upwards. That's, that's his look, alayhi salatu wasalam. And his cheeks will be red, red, red cheeks, and he's white in color. So he is a Isa alayhi salam, very handsome man. Will come down and he will enter, he will enter this masjid. And the Muslims will notice him. And al-Mahdi will walk back so that Isa alayhi salam can pray imam. And he will say, Every nation has its own imam which Allah has appointed and you are the appointed imam of this nation. So remain in your position. So Isa comes down for a different purpose. And he prays behind al-Mahdi. That's how important al-Mahdi is. Isa alayhi salam prays behind him. After that in the hadith it says he wipes the face of the Muslims that are in there. And he informs them of their places in Jannah. What they have. They go off to al-Maqdis to fight the army of the Dajjal. And in al-Maqdis in Jerusalem... The, the Dajjal would have come with an army with him. He will not know that Isa alayhi salam is with Al-Mahdi and the Muslim army. And they'll enter, they'll, they'll find them on the borders of the Temple of Solomon, as you call it. You know, that's that temple where Maqdis is. That's, that's where Sulaiman alayhi salam had his kingdom built. They will exit and find a Dajjal with his army. A Dajjal, as soon as he sees Isa alayhi salam, he runs away. Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam said, he runs away and he begins to melt. Literally melt. But before Isa a.s. lets him melt, Isa a.s. follows him with a sword and kills him. So he bleeds and he dies. And he says to the people, if he was a god, how can I kill him? See, if he melted and gone and dissolved, they'll think he's a god. But he killed him and he says to prove to the people he is not a god. Allahu a'lam, if whether there is any repentance at that time, people can embrace Islam or not. The news is conflicting. We don't know if the sun has risen yet at that time because Rasul said when the sun rises from the west, 
no more repentance will be accepted, or whether there is still time for repentance. If there is time for repentance, only a small amount of people will be there to repent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Isa alayhi salam will live. Allahu alam for how long? Some narrations say 10 years, others say 40 years. But what I do know is that the narrations tell us that he will outlive Al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Al-Mahdi will live for 10 years and he will fill it with justice. As I said before, and Isa alayhi salam will die later on. So Isa alayhi salam will really die finally. At the moment, we believe Isa alayhi salam was risen. And he is alive. And he will be returned. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But Allah lifted him to him. In a way we don't understand. Now, whether it's at this time, or before this time, or close to that time, we don't know. The point is, when the, when the first major sign appears, the other major signs come after each other. Meaning there's not much space between them at all. And we're not talking about years, we're talking about just maybe a few days, or probably even in the same day, probably a few weeks. They come after each other very quickly. Signs after signs after signs. Keep in mind, minor signs are still going. More minor signs are happening. But the major signs come after each other. Rasulullah described it like a bead. When you break that string and the beads come out one after the other. So none of them come at the same time together, but they come after each other, but closely after each other, the major signs. It's like the end of the world is running out quickly. The world is coming to its end. It's dying, like a person on his deathbed. Sickness after sickness after sickness. And if you realize now what's going to be actually be happening is that Al-Mahdi dies, Isa alayhi salam dies. Then during that time or shortly after, the sun rises from where it sets. Rasul Sallallahu says, Tawbah, repentance, returning back to Allah, renewing your faith with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, will always be accepted. Unless two things happen, one of two things. Until the soul reaches the gargling point when you die. Repentance is accepted until the soul reaches the gargling. You go like this. And when the sun rises from where it sits, that's the end of time. No more repentance, no more conversion to Islam. خلاص. The way you are is the way you are. Kafir, kafir, Muslim, Muslim. Uh, one who didn't pray, one who didn't pray. One ask, خلاص. The way you are is the way you are. The sun will rise like this. Scientific theories at the moment tell us that the universe is changing and the galaxies are changing. And I don't know if you know much about the expansion of the universe. This was a, a fact discovered at the time of Albert Einstein. And now it's a fact, scientific fact, that the universe has been expanding for billions of years. This is true. And the Qur'an sort of hints to it. Some scholars interpret, We, we built the sky and the sky is expanding. The point is, they say it's going to reach a point where it will stop and then there will be something what they call a big crunch. Or another universe is going to be formed. This is what they say. Non-Muslim scientists say. Nevertheless, what we do know, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, the world will change. And the universe will crunch. And everything will be reversed. So the sun, the direction of the sun that we see will be the opposite way. This also shows that everything in the solar system will be the opposite way. And so the world will reverse and the crunches will happen. For when that sun rises, there is no more repentance. And closely after that, more and more faith is taken away from the world till finally the Qur'an is taken, until the Kaaba is even destroyed and there wouldn't be one single Muslim muwahid on the face of the earth left. But there are a few more signs before that happens. We'll leave them insha'Allah till next week. Talk about them. Jazakumullahu khair. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah.